tal? Bienvenidos a Alcanzando el Conocimiento, una herramienta vital. Y bueno, pues estamos con un científico muy interesante, él es el doctor Kevin Hunt, él es astrobiólogo y él pertenece al Jet Propulsion Laboratory de la NASA y está haciendo investigaciones muy interesantes. Kevin, ¿cómo estás? ¿Cómo estás, Kevin? Muy bien, gracias. Es un placer estar aquí. Gracias, es un gran placer estar aquí. Kevin, eh, si nos podrías decir, ¿qué significa ser un astrobiólogo? ¿A qué se dedica? So, uh, astrobiology is the study of the living universe. Uh, we're trying to understand the origin, evolution, and distribution of life on Earth and beyond. And within astrobiology, there are um, uh, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, uh, uh, geologists, all sorts of different people coming together to try and answer this question of whether or not uh, there is life on planets like Mars or life within the ocean of Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, my specialty is uh, physics and astronomy uh, and, uh, and so I have a lab at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where we do experiments, chemistry and physics experiments related to ice and ice chemistry uh, and some of these worlds like Europa where we think there's a liquid water ocean. But I also use telescopes and, uh, and do spectroscopy of, uh, of these worlds. Uh, and I also do field work. I go out to places on Earth where uh, most life can't live, like the, the mountains of, of Antarctica, and I study microbes in the rocks um, and uh, creatures in the ocean depths. So it's a, it's a wide and varying um, uh, endeavor, uh, but it takes people from many different disciplines to try and address this question of what is, wh where did we come from, uh, and is there life beyond Earth? ¿Por qué tú elegiste estudiar Júpiter y no, estudi no elegiste Marte, Saturno, otro planeta? ¿Por qué Júpiter? ¿Qué te llamó la atención? Well, so when, when we think about the search for life elsewhere, the first thing that we're looking for is liquid water. If life on Earth has taught us anything, it's that where you find the liquid water, you find life. And so when we look out in our solar system for places where we might find life, we look for liquid water. And many people have probably followed the, the search for life on Mars. Uh, the, the Curiosity rover is currently roving across the surface and, and looking uh, at a region on Mars where we think liquid water existed in the past. And so the Curiosity rover is looking for geological evidence of life in the past. But we also have worlds in our solar system like these moons of Jupiter, uh, in particular Europa, where we think liquid water oceans exist today. Uh, and so Europa is this tiny little moon, it's about the size of our moon, it orbits Jupiter, and as it orbits Jupiter it's tugged and pulled by the tides, and that energy of the tides helps maintain this liquid water ocean. It's an ocean made of of water, of H2O, of, uh, you know, water that you could drink, except we think there's salt in it, so you, you know, it's, it's fine water, but it would be too salty. It'd be kind of like drinking ocean water here on Earth. But it's there today. It's an ocean that's there today. And it's likely been there for much of the history of the solar system. So this is a wonderfully intriguing place to search for living life, life that's there today. And uh, so that's part of why I'm focused on, on that world and part of why we're excited to get a mission out uh, to Jupiter to explore this, this, this tiny little moon that's got this vast global liquid water ocean. Hasta ahora, eh, solo las exploraciones que está haciendo el Jet Propulsion Laboratory eh, solamente son a través de robots. Nadie puede ir ahora a Europa. Nobody would probably want to go to Europa. Uh, it's a very, very harsh environment. Uh, now, I would love to go and, and see it, but the problem is uh, that you wouldn't survive for long. Um, it's, uh, 
Uh, Europa is not a very good place for, for humans. Gases. There's no atmosphere. Uh, it's it's uh, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. Um, uh, there's intense radiation from Jupiter's magnetic field. Uh, now, if you could go into the ocean in a in a submersible, that would be fun. But uh, but the problem is you would probably die getting there. So so we have to send robots. Robots. Yeah. Y pero entonces con esas condiciones tan difíciles, tan agrestes, ¿cómo es que se puede pensar en la idea, la posibilidad de que hay vida? ¿Cuáles son los indicios? Mm. So, uh, when, I mentioned when we when we look for life, we're looking for liquid water. So Europa has liquid water. Another thing that's very important for life as we know it is that you have to have the elements that are needed for life. We are made of water and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and iron and a few other metals and things like that. And we think that Europa has those elements that are needed for life. And the next thing that life needs is some form of energy. Um, we, of course, we, we eat food and we breathe oxygen and we get our energy from, uh, from doing that. Microbes, tiny microbes, find all sorts of different ways and, and uh, things to, to eat. Uh, and we think on Europa, there might be liquid water, the elements needed for life, and the chemical energy for microbial life to exist, and possibly more advanced and complex life. We don't know. Uh, that's part of the experiment that we need to do. Yeah. Um, y bueno, um, si lo que te pregunté hace un momento, si se encontraran esas bacterias, esas eh, cosas microscópicas de vida, ¿algunas podrían ser peligrosas para los humanos? ¿O diferentes solamente? Um, well, on Europa, we, we would just send robots on a one-way trip. Uh, they would not come back, so, so no European microbes would be, would be harmful to us. But, um, but here's uh, an interesting aspect of, of why the search for life elsewhere is, is important. Um, all life on Earth is based on the same biochemistry, DNA, RNA, and proteins. And part of what intrigues me about the search for life on worlds like Europa is that maybe there's a different biochemistry, maybe there's a different way of getting the business of life done. Uh, we think that Europa has the, the water and the carbon and all those things, and does that then lead to the same biomolecules like DNA, RNA, and proteins? We don't know. We have to do the experiment. And if life on Europa were based on the same biochemistry, then maybe it will provide some insights into our own biochemistry. If it's based on a completely different biochemistry, then that will teach us new things about how life in general works. Uh, because for all, our, for all of our knowledge of the universe, this thing we call life is still quite a mystery. And uh, it's an exciting mystery. And, and finding life on other worlds gives us another example to study and understand and to appreciate. Por ejemplo, hablando de vida de otros planetas, eh, la misión apenas el Curiosity, pues se estuvo explorando, eh, ya bueno, acaban de decir que parece que no hay vida en Marte, pero ¿qué similitudes pueden tener el planeta Marte con la Luna Europa? ¿O diferencias? Um, so, um, how, how is Europa different from Mars and, and, the, and the Earth? Mm -hmm. Uno es un planeta y otro es una luna, pero ¿puede haber algo yeah. en común? Yeah. Well, it, it, this is part of what's um, been a, a bit of a surprise to astronomers and planetary scientists. Um, Europa is this tiny moon, and yet it's got this ocean. Um, we used to think that in order for a planet to be habitable, in order for a planet to have life, 
you needed to have liquid water on the surface, you needed to have a nice atmosphere, you needed to be at just the right distance from the sun so that you could keep that water on the surface. If you were like Venus, too close to the sun, then you were too hot. If you were like Mars, a little too far away, then you were too cold. But if you were at the distance of the Earth to the sun, then you were just right. But what we're learning from these moons like Europa is that there's a different way to, to maintain liquid water, to, to maintain a potentially habitable environment. And on Europa, it's that tug and pull as tiny little Europa goes around big Jupiter, um, it's getting squeezed and tugged by the gravitational pull, the tidal energy. Um, everyone's familiar with our moon and the Earth and the tidal interaction of our Earth and the moon. It raises the tides and the oceans. And Europa is about the size of our moon, but it orbits massive Jupiter. So just imagine the tides, the tug and pull on Europa. And that's part of what we think provides the energy needed to maintain that liquid water ocean. So Earth has life, <laughs> right? Earth has oceans on the surface. Mars is cold and dry today, but we look at the geology of Mars and there's good evidence for Mars having had oceans and lakes and rivers in the past. So the Curiosity rover is looking at the, the rocks on Mars to see whether or not there's any signs of life that once existed on Mars. On Europa, even though it's covered in ice, the ocean beneath that ice shell we think could be habitable today. So there might be living life on Europa today. Eh, yo siento y noto una gran pasión de ti por conocer pues, eh, el universo, por conocer muchas cosas que no es tan fácil porque es muy lejano a la Tierra para empezar. Y de pronto, ¿qué podríamos esperar los, ter los terrícolas aquí? ¿Que realmente haya vida en otra parte? ¿Que nos podamos mudar? ¿Cuál es la esperanza, la posibilidad? que haya cosas que se puedan extraer de otras partes? So, someday, humans will likely live on Mars. Uh, uh, Mars is a relatively nice planet for humans. Uh, we would have to do some things to make it, uh, make it a little bit warmer and, and have oxygen in the atmosphere. But you can envision decades, if not centuries from now, colonies on the surface of Mars. Um, also, decades and, and centuries from now, we will be mining asteroids um, for rare metals and, and uh, things that we need for some of the technology that we uh, use here on Earth. Um, but my pursuit, the pursuit of, of astrobiology uh, and the, the search for life elsewhere, is at the heart about the pursuit of new knowledge, about um, making discoveries that will revolutionize our understanding and perception of the universe around us. Um, you know, it was, it was 400 years ago, actually 402 years ago, when Galileo Galilei first used his small telescope to look up at Jupiter and to see the tiny little spots of light around Jupiter, which he figured out were moons. And by doing that, and by mapping the moons of Jupiter 400 years ago, Galileo revolutionized our understanding of the universe. We went from this idea of the Earth being the center of the universe and everything orbiting the Earth to this Copernican revolution, the, uh, the, the understanding that Jupiter is a planet, the Earth is a planet, 
our planets orbit the sun, the sun is a star, and the stars that we see in the night sky are also suns. And they may have planets of their own. And those planets might also have life. So that revolution 400 years ago, I think, has the potential to continue on in our exploration of our solar system and other worlds um, today. In the next few decades, we will build the instruments, build the robots, build the spacecraft that will go to worlds like Europa to figure out whether or not the science of biology works beyond Earth. You know, in the, in the decades since Galileo, we've come to learn and appreciate mm -hmm. that the laws of physics work here on Earth, but they also work on worlds and wonders beyond the Earth. And we've also come to learn that the principles of chemistry work not just here on Earth, but also on worlds and wonders elsewhere. And we've also come to learn that geology, the principles of geology, work beyond Earth. But when it comes to the science of biology, when it comes to the bizarre phenomenon of life, we have yet to make that leap. Everything that we've learned about life on Earth leads us to believe that, yeah, if the conditions are right, we should find life elsewhere. But we need to do the experiment. We need to figure out whether or not the science of biology works beyond Earth, whether or not there is life beyond Earth. And that will be the beginning of a revolution in biology, because everything that we know about life and biology is based on life here on Earth. And as we continue to study life here and continue to search for life beyond, we get a better understanding of what this beautiful thing we call life really is. Por último, Kevin, cada día que te levantas como científico, ¿qué te alimenta a seguir? What inspires you as yeah. a scientist? <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> I have a, a, a deep sense of wonder um, and, and imagination and creativity that are at the heart of, of I think, both science and, and art. Um, you know, scientists and, and musicians and artists, and we all share a common thread of, of of wonder and awe and imagination and creativity. Um, and, you know, I, I got interested in astronomy and the search for life elsewhere as a, as a young boy. I grew up in a small town where I could camp out at night and look at the night sky above. And as a young boy growing up in a small town, seeing the stars above, you can't help but wonder whether or not those stars have planets and those planets have life. And my job now involves a lot of math, a lot of physics, a lot of engineering, uh, a lot of computers and programming and, and uh, complex things. But at the heart of it, I'm still asking the same question that I was asking when I was 12 years old. I'm just doing it with more math and more physics. <laughs> and and, and uh, part of what's exciting to see here in Mexico is that uh, as a nation, as a country, um, Mexico is continuing with its long tradition of, of astronomy. You know, if you, if you look at uh, the history of, of Mexican cultures, uh, just like me being a small boy growing up in a remote town in the state of Vermont in the United States, um, many of the, the students that I've met have also grown up in small towns in Mexico and they've become fascinated by the search for life elsewhere because they grew up looking up, up at the night sky. And the traditional cultures of Mexico have long been fascinated by the stars above and astronomy. Uh, and today, here in Mexico, you see a continuation of that. The Large Millimeter Telescope uh, is the next step. It's, uh, it's a continuation of that, of that wonderful tradition. And uh, many of the students that I've met, uh, many of the scientists that I've interacted with, um, will have this great resource, uh, this telescope, 
to study the universe, to look at far and distant galaxies, uh, to look at some of the, the earliest things that, uh, that formed in our universe. Um, they'll be able to look at stars soon after they're born. They'll be able to study the formation of planets. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, what, what gets me out of bed is the same thing that gets uh, my fellow scientists here in Mexico out of bed. Uh, I, th this excitement, this wonder, uh, this desire to pursue new knowledge uh, and, uh, and, and to study the universe kind of like the way an artist studies a painting. Uh, you know, the universe is a beautiful mosaic. Uh, wherever you look, there's always something, some new piece of wonder to explore. And, uh, and so that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Pues muchas gracias, Kevin. Gracias por esta entrevista. Gracias. Uh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> okay. Y bueno, pues esta entrevista no se hubiera podido lograr sin la participación de SOMA, la Sociedad Mexicana de Astrobiología, y bueno, también con el apoyo de Irma Lozada. Irma, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien. Muy, muy feliz de estar aquí. Irma, platícanos cómo eh, ha sido esta visita durante toda esta semana de Kevin Hahn y pues un evento de astrobiología que han tenido muy interesante con el apoyo de la Universidad Autónoma de México. Sí, pues ha sido una semana muy intensa. Básicamente empezamos con algo que se está volviendo una tradición en la sociedad, que es el Día de la Astrobiología. Generalmente se hace a final de año y se, eh, eh, se enfoca a un aspecto en particular de las investigaciones en astrobiología. Tuvimos esa, esa, ese coloquio y ahora estamos concluyendo eh, un curso en astrobiología dedicado a los mundos congelados, que es la especialidad de Kevin. Muy bien. ¿Y cómo les ha ido en esta semana? Sensacional. Hemos tenido la participación en un, en un auditorio con 120 estudiantes de diferentes universidades del país. Estamos conectados por sistema de videoconferencia a cuatro estados del país también y tenemos un link, eh, una unión también al Centro de Astrobiología de la, de la NASA en España. Entonces, la verdad es que ha sido muy exitoso el curso. ¿Y cómo pensaron en Kevin? Bueno, eh, de hecho, sí, eh, Kevin es el astrobiólogo eh, ideal. Eh, eh, Kevin Hahn es, eh, podríamos decir algo que, que busca en el ideal de la astrobiología, es un biólogo, es un geólogo, tiene conocimientos muy amplios de química, de física, de astronomía. Completísimo. Además, bueno, no solamente eh, hace cuestiones de eh, investigación teórica, sino también hace, investiga hace experimentos, eh, va a hacer prácticas de campo para recoger muestras en los océanos, en los, en, en los eh, hielos, eh, polos, eh, lagos salados, en los lugares más extremos. De hecho, eh, eh, Kevin ha recibido una serie de reconocimientos internacionales sumamente importantes. Entre ellos se encuentra el, eh, el, explo el, explorador, eh, el premio al explorador emergente de National Geographic del año pasado, del 2011, lo cual de cierta forma hace un reconocimiento a esa labor tan extensa a lo largo de diferentes eh, pa, eh, lugares del mundo en los que se, se intenta caracterizar la vida extrema en nuestro planeta. Y bueno, por último, Soma, ¿cuáles son los eh, planes eh, para más adelante que tiene con la astrobiología? Y sobre todo, bueno, pues el mensaje para los jóvenes que se acerquen a Soma. Claro. La Sociedad Mexicana de Astrobiología tiene 12 años, lo cual le ha, permito, le, le ha permitido desarrollarse. Tenemos una cadena eh, aproximadamente de 80 eh, eh, miembros en la sociedad, entre la gran mayoría investigadores y, y estudiantes, eh, eh, dedicados a diferentes áreas, química, geología, astronomía, eh, geología, todas las áreas que se cubren en astrobiología. Tenemos planes que se enfocan tanto en la educación eh, media superior y superior, también tenemos planes que se enfocan eh, a la divulgación científica, queremos también eh, poder aportar a la comunidad científica en esta área. Eh, tenemos también, eh, estamos eh, empezando un proyecto de afiliación internacional con el Centro de Astrobiología de la NASA en Estados Unidos, que esperamos que se pueda concretar eh, en enero o febrero de, de este año que, que entre en el 2013. Entonces, eh, la verdad es que el mensaje para todas aquellas estudiantes o personas interesadas en la astrobiología en México es que existe un grupo trabajando en México que ya tenemos años de experiencia 
que cada vez estamos obteniendo apoyo como de Kevin, eh, de muchos otros investigadores que han venido a visitarnos a México y que es el tiempo para poder, si de verdad quieren verse, ver su vida en un sueño y poder eh, entender eh, si existe vida en otros planetas de una forma seria, profesional y científica, en México lo podemos hacer. Pues muchas gracias, Irma. A ti. Pues gracias a todos por haber estado aquí en una emisión más de Alcanzando el Conocimiento.